allowing my Facebook followers to have a word on the floor tonight. They are watching us. They will be responding. But I think they are very appreciative that you have allowed me this time uh, to condense those comments and the words that they gave to me to bring to the floor. I yield back. Well, Ms. Waters, thank you so very much for sharing with us the, uh, the words that you've received from your constituents. I know that uh, for me and I suspect for many of our colleagues, it was, there were similar uh, words, similar comments to us. It's time for us to get with it. Let's pass the jobs bill. Let's really work for the people out there, not only the unemployed, but for the great middle class that have been pushed down uh, over the last uh, decade. It's time for them to have their say. And thank you so very, very much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you so very much. I thank you. That. You said something that uh, came to my mind. I'm going to do this quickly before I turn to my colleague from uh, Rhode, excuse me, Rhode Island. Um, <laughs> You, you mentioned uh, student loans. Yes. Now, the president has been out in California, in, in yes. Los Angeles, and yes. in San Francisco near my district, and he's been saying something that really caught my attention, and that is, we can't wait. Speaking for the American people, we can't wait for Congress to act. We can't wait. And he did something that is really, really close to home. My, my daughter and son-in-law uh, are have just finished medical school. They have huge loans that they took out to, uh, to go through medical school. But across this nation, about a trillion dollars of loans have been taken out by young men and women and, and older who have gone back to school to improve themselves, to get an education, uh, to learn a skill. A trillion dollars out there. And much of those, uh, many of those loans are at a very high interest rates and they may be from different sectors. And the president says, we can't wait to help these people. These young men and women and others who have these loans, they need help today. And so he put together a, a, a new pr program based upon a law that we passed last year, the Democrats That's passed right. last year, that said uh, we're going to do some consolidation. So he's taken that step. He's going to allow for the consolidation of these loans into one loan package and allow the interest rate to be reduced on the average at least a half a percent interest rates and stretched out. And if over 25 and, and a small percentage of the income, and many of these young men and women, I'm going to say men and women, they're not all young, unable to get a job other than just a minimum wage, and so they can't pay. That's right. So he's given them a break. Yes. And that's what we want our president Absolutely. to do. We want our president to go out there and say, we can't wait for Congress, that's right. even though I'm ready to go, and I know my colleagues are, and giving them a break. This is really important that he's done this. I thank you. That is well said, and you are absolutely correct. And the young people are waiting on us to act. Uh, they are burdened with the debt. Uh, they can't get careers started. They can't get families started. And so this uh, will be very helpful to them. The consolidation and the reduction of the interest rate is extremely important. Well, we can't wait to get a bill out of this House. And hopefully the Speaker will allow us to bring it to the floor. And I can't wait to hear from Mr. Courtney <laughs> of Rhode Island. Mr. Courtney, please join us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garamendi. Connecticut, Rhode Island, you know, when you're from California, I'm sure uh, we all look like uh, one of your counties uh, there. So, uh, but it's eastern Connecticut. At least I abut Rhode Island. But thank you for uh, the invitation to come down and, and speak this evening. And I wanted to start, first of all, by just uh, sharing with you that I am in the final day of a one-week challenge that uh, myself and four other members of uh, Congress have engaged in to live on a food stamp budget for a week. Um, that's $4 a day. And uh, which is what the budget is for millions of Americans today. Um, and my wife and I and my daughter um, got through it in one piece, although I had to kind of take my little sort of uh, care package down to D.C. with me. And, um, and, and frankly, it has been harder than I thought and a real eye-opener. I mean, a cup and a half of Excuse coffee. Excuse me. Yes. May I interrupt? You and three of your colleagues or four of your colleagues have undertaken a program to try to live on the unemployment insurance is no, this is a food stamp budget. Oh, the, the SNAP, food stamp, the SNAP the food program. stamp budget. And, and again, the SNAP budget for millions of Americans is four dollars a day. And so, um, obviously, you've got to shop as uh, aggressively as you possibly can. And frankly, you're buying sort of uh, somewhat lower cost items. And um, and as I said, we're we're about to get across the finish line at midnight tonight, which. Um, uh, but and, and again, you know, a cup and a half of coffee a day, you know, sort of half a peanut butter sandwich for lunch generic cereal, little bananas, 
um, and uh, again, um, some meals at night, which, um, I mean, you don't have to worry about cleaning dishes when you're on this kind of a budget because you eat every bit of it. And, um, and as I said, it has been a real eye-opener in terms of uh, the fact that this is really um, an experience that isn't just limited to one week for millions of Americans. It's, it's something that, um, again, it's just part of a, a growing reality. And I, I raise it in the context of the JOBS Act because today there are, again, millions of Americans who are 99 they're people who have gone through their unemployment compensation period, uh, which, as we all know, uh, has a cap of 99 weeks. And for a lot of them, there really is no nothing else waiting at the end of that time other than uh, food stamps or the uh, SNAP program, as it's now called. Um, and, you know, to, to basically live on $32, which is really what the, the, the amount is for a single adult, is really impossible. And as a result, we're seeing, again, record numbers of people showing up at food banks, record numbers of people showing up at soup kitchens. Um, there is now a suburbanization of poverty that's going on in this country. Um, again, I represent Connecticut, which has the highest per capita income in America, obviously lots of suburbs. And there are now, again, food banks that are operating in a lot of these communities. And, you know, clearly um, this is an issue in terms of the super committee and the uh, sequestration, you know, whether or not a program like SNAP is going to be at risk and, and for people to go backwards from $4 a day is something that I personally can't imagine. But at the end of the day, the real solution is to get this economy growing again and the best social program is a job. I mean, that is the bottom line in terms of what is a real um, fix to this problem. And, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to, again, spend a minute on and then hand it over to my friend from Ohio who's here is that uh, the pay for that's been proposed and su supported in the Senate and the, and the White House is a 5% surcharge on, on income above a million dollars. And recently we had, again, in my opinion, a patriotic, courageous American who stepped forward to really put the spotlight on what that means. Warren Buffett. Um, who, uh, again, is a legendary um, investor, financier, commentator uh, on all the news programs and the business channels, um, shared his tax return for last year. And his gross income, his top line was $63 million. His adjusted gross income was $32 million. And his uh, payment was roughly about $6 billion. And as he um, explained in a number of op-eds, that roughly translates into a tax rate of 17%, which, again, you're here, Johnny, on the spot with the uh, parts, which is terrific. If, you, if his uh, tax return was subjected to the surcharge, which has been proposed and supported in the Senate, basically it would add about another two to three million dollars of tax liability uh, in terms of what his return would be, and his overall effective rate would be roughly about 25 percent. And he clearly makes the argument about the Buffett rule that he shouldn't pay a higher rate than his secretary and his staff, which today he pays a lower rate than all of them. But the real, I think, power of his argument, which he made in the New York Times op-ed piece, Stop Coddling the Rich, was that the tax rates that were he paid gladly back in the 80s and 90s, uh, which again is even higher than it would be if we passed the, the, uh, the, the surcharge, did nothing to inhibit his willingness or desire to go out and compete and invest and participate in the, in the drive for the American dream. And if you look at the growth rates that we experienced in the 1990s, when again, the tax rates on both capital gains and regular income was much higher than it, it is today and would be still higher than if we adopted the Jobs Act pay for, um, as he art you know, powerfully makes the, the, the point, it would do nothing to inhibit growth and it would do nothing to inhibit or punish success. Um, it, in fact, would just do a lot to try and create some balance in our public finances so that we can afford to do the great things that a great nation um, must do to get us out of the predicament that we're in today. And, you know, what I want to just say to anyone who's watching here today who's on food stamps, having experienced briefly the challenge that you face over a one-week period of time, um, you know, we can do better as a nation than that, and that we must adopt the JOBS Act to make sure that we solve the problems of Americans who today are trapped in, a, in a, an economy that allows no way out except subsistence programs that is inadequate to lead a healthy, productive life. And with that, I would yield back to you, Mr. Garamendi. Well, I thank the gentleman from Connecticut.
my apologies, uh, Rhode Island being not too far away. But uh, thank you very much, and thank you for pointing out that uh, it's very, very difficult in America if you're poor, and one out of six Americans now live in poverty and are dependent upon food stamps and other kinds of subsistence in order simply to stay alive. Uh, and we cannot forget that, although we ought to remember that uh, here on this floor very recently there was an effort to reduce the food stamps. So I don't quite understand why anybody would want to do that given the poverty rate. And you also spoke to the issue of fairness in taxes. Eighty-four percent of all of the wealth in this nation is now controlled by the top 20 percent, and the bottom have become more and more poor. Now, one of the states that is struggling to get back into the American dream is the state of Ohio. And there's a lot of uh, conflict going on there about uh, labor and politics and the like. But I know, Mr. Ryan, that you're focused solely on trying to get people back to work in your community. So if you'd please join us, if I recall correctly, you're from the eastern part of Ohio. That is correct, the northeastern part. And I'm happy to be joined with my colleague from the northwestern uh, part, uh, Ms. Kaptur. Um, to talk about these issues. And I think as I sat here and I listened, uh, whether it was California uh, or whether it was Connecticut or whether it's Ohio, I think the number one issue facing the country right now is the income inequality. And it is now just starting to percolate up as the number one issue. Greatest inequality in this country since the Great Depression. Uh, I know many of us have been talking about this for a long, long time. Uh, to where we've had 30 years of stagnant wages in the United States. And there is no way that we're going to be able to continue to be uh, the leader of the free world or really even have the kind of country that we want if we have this kind of level of inequality. And there are issues that come before the House of Representatives. There are issues that the President is continuing to push that will help rectify this problem that is not getting any attention at all in the House of Representatives, whether it's the American Jobs Act, which would put people back to work, infrastructure, roads, bridges, get that 20% uh, unemployment within the construction trades, or 18 or 19, or whatever it may be, uh, and drive it down. The China currency bill passed by the Senate with well over uh, 60 votes to pass it, passed the House of Representatives last year, had 99 Republicans, 350 total votes, and we can't get a vote in the House of Representatives to take on the Chinese. Which Explain would, to us what the Chinese currency bill is all about. Well, the currency, they're manipulating their currency. They're devaluing it so that the exports coming into the United States are artificially cheaper than they would normally be already with benefits of no EPA, no OSHA, you know, no regulations. Um, but in addition to that, they manipulate their currency, devalue it to make those exports even cheaper, landing on the shores of the United States. Now, all of these unfair trade practices have cost the United States 2.8 million jobs in the last 10 years, 1.9 million of those are manufacturing and 100,000 in Ohio. When manufacturing jobs pay more, there's more intellectual property spin-off, better benefits, better pension. All of this comes together with an issue that we're facing back in Ohio and a philosophy in the country that is basically saying if the middle class just made a little bit less, the country would be better off we'd finally fix these problems. And that's what's happening with uh, SB5 and Issue 2 in Ohio, where we have a Republican administration taking on the teachers, the police, and the fire, and saying they make too much money. And it's because of them that we have these huge budget issues, when really they're the last bastion of the middle class, and they run into burning buildings and they go out and they take care of us when we're in a dangerous situation, or they, or they teach our kids, or they clean the public restrooms, or they clean the restrooms in the schools. These are people who serve us, all of us as a country. And for us to continue to go down the path of 
we got to dismantle the middle class. We've got to dismantle the unions. We've got to cut programs like Pell Grants or food stamps or things that help us invest or keep interest rates high on student loans or cut funding for the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation. This is not a recipe for success. This is a recipe for the destruction of the middle class. These are investments we've always made as a country that have benefited us. And to say to these police and fire and teachers and public employees, you're making too much money, you're part of the problem, when they're making 30, 35,000 a year, is ridiculous. And the policies coming out of Washington and the House of Representatives, we don't even have the courage to take on China. To say maybe we'll drive some manufacturing jobs back in the United States, create some wealth back in the United States so these local communities have money to fund their police and fire. This is what we've always done. And one final point, you're starting to see it percolate. You know, you saw it in Wisconsin. The coalition in Ohio now against this issue too is incredible. Police, fire, teachers, public employees, building trades, auto workers, machinists, average people all coming together to say this is the middle class and we've had it up to here. And Occupy Wall Street, same thing. In income inequality, high levels, been going on for a long time. People are up to here. And for a while, my friend, they have said, go get Washington, D.C. Look at them. Look, it's the Democrats. Or get, the, get them. It's their fault. But the reality is, it's where the money is. And that concentration of wealth you were talking about, that's driving the policies here. Somebody explain to me how we can pass a China currency bill last year with 350 votes, 99 Republicans, and we can't get a vote in the House of Representatives on it now. Senate just passed it. Because there are some very powerful interests that don't want it on the floor. They don't want to vote on this. They like the system just the way it is. They can locate over in China and ship their product back, and the Americans will buy it. But what's coming home to roost now is that the Americans aren't making the wages they were in the last 20 or 30 years. The consumer spending is down. Consumer confidence is down. Wages are stagnant. High levels of poverty, even in the suburbs. And so it's all coming home to roost. And uh, I think it's time for our country and all of these disparate groups that are now coming together police, fire, teachers, building trades, working class people. I'm telling you, in Ohio they're coming together and they're saying we are the middle class, we are working America, and we are going to set the agenda. And we can't wait. We cannot wait. I'm just going to toss out two more statistics here. The top 1% of Americans in 1974 had about 9% of income of all sources, capital gains, interest, dividends, as well as earned income, about 9%. In 2007, that was four years ago, they had 23.5%. So you've seen the income of the very few at the top grow extraordinary from 9 to 23. It's probably up 25, 27% this year. The top one-tenth of 1%, one this is 15,000 families in America, have raked in more than a trillion dollars of income in 2009. Just 15,000 families, a trillion dollars of income. And yet, when the Senate took up the bill to provide about two million jobs for America to be paid for by these men and women and families that have had this extraordinary growth in their income, just a small percentage of a surcharge 5% surcharge on that additional income, the Republicans in the Senate refused to pass that bill. So 280,000 teachers are not going to get a job. 100,000 police and firemen will not be back on our streets protecting us. And $50 billion of construction programs will not be built. 35,000 schools will not be renovated. And all across this nation, the pain of the middle class will continue. It's time for us to have a better deal for America. The American Jobs Act can do that. 
and I think it can help Ohio in the central part. Ms. Kaptur, if you would care to join us, thank you so very much. A terrific representative who I know has fought fiercely for years and years here to bring back to middle America the manufacturing base and the middle income jobs that are so important. Congressman Garamendi, I want to thank you for your leadership coming from California and uh, my dear, dear colleague Tim Ryan uh, from the eastern quarter of Ohio. Uh, what a privilege it is to be here with you as well and to be a voice for we the people. We the people, not just the super rich people, not just the people running the six biggest banks in the country that just took the rest of America to the cleaners, but Americans who speak for the vast majority who, like that chart states, want a better deal for America. We want investment in America. We want to make goods in America because we know when we create here and we make here, we create jobs here, and we create real wealth here for everyone, not just the privileged few. It's really an amazing fact to think about that General Motors, when I was growing up, was the biggest employer in the country. And uh, Northern Ohio just hummed. Plants had 14,000 workers, 10,000 workers. Uh, now you're lucky if a plant has 1,200 workers and you see shuttered plants around our country. Thank God for the recovery package and what was done to resuscitate and refinance the U.S. automotive industry so that other countries can't eat our lunch, that they can't eat our investment capital and all of the investment that still exists around this country, the millions of families and retirees that depend on a healthy automotive sector. But when you think about it, today Walmart is the largest employer. We have gone from General Motors being the largest employer to Walmart being the largest employer. And this week, Walmart announced that even though it's the largest employer, even though it's making so much money for its shareholders and top executives, that if you work for Walmart uh, and you put in under 24 hours uh, a week work, you're not eligible for their health insurance. Yep, I can just think of all those women, all those people that are working in Walmarts around the country uh, their standard of living will drop. I agree with Congressman Ryan and what he says about the middle class. We believe in people earning a living and as a result being secure in the middle class, earning a decent wage, getting a decent health benefit, having a retirement program you can depend upon. I'm really happy that the cost of living increase uh, will give on average to seniors across this country 360 extra dollars 360 extra dollars a year on average because they're going to be able to buy some food, better food for themselves. They're going to be able to pay their utility bills. They're going to, you know, the first thing they'll do? I'll tell you, the first thing they'll do, they're going to buy their grandchildren presents. They're going to go spend that money, all right? They're going to spend it in the economy. Every single business in this country, what do they say? We need customers. We need customers. We don't have enough people working, carrying 14 to 24 million people unemployed or underemployed to really get this economy to hum. They're waiting for customers. Every member of Congress, if they're awake, knows that. And so when we see a call for a better deal for America, for all the people, for we the people, not just for the Wall Street science who brought us to this juncture, who, by the way, are doing very well and controlling two-thirds of the financial system of this country, which is part of the problem we are facing, too much power in too few hands. But as we look across our country to say, what can we do as members in order to create more of an investment climate here? You create investment when you create customers. And honestly, you don't create customers and create wealth at the same time when you just take all the stuff that's made in China, bring it here and sell it. That money goes, most of it goes back to where those goods were made. So we have a real challenge in our country to reward, make it in America, to make goods here, to sell goods here. And as Congressman Ryan says, for those countries that don't play by the rules, and China doesn't, whether it's on currency, whether it's on the environment, whether it's on the fair treatment of workers, they're not even living in the same universe as we live in. Who would want to live in Beijing? You'd need a gas mask to survive, 
All right, is that really what we want to do is downgrade our standard of living for the American people to that level? And that is the course we are on. That is the course we are on, Congressman Garamendi. When you talk about how many people in America are poor today, you think they like being poor? God loves them just as he loves everybody in the upper class and the middle class. They don't want to be poor. They want a job. Here's a figure. Let me put this one on the table. I was talking to one of the major rail executives today, and I was inviting him to come out to our region because we have a lot of railroads, and they're hiring. And he said, Congresswoman, I want you to know something. We posted 4,000 jobs in rail across this country. And he said, guess how many applications we got? 500,000. 500,000 applications for 4,000 jobs. All right, think about what the American people are saying to us. Austerity will not bring prosperity. What will bring prosperity is investment in America, making goods in America, creating goods in America, growing products in America, processing products in America, and holding our trade partners accountable for their actions, whether it's currency manipulation or renegotiating trade agreements that are not operating in the interest of the United States, that are far out of balance. And let me tell you, the most out of balance trade agreement is with China is with China. And if you go back to NAFTA, when it passed here in 1993, they said, oh my goodness, there are going to be millions of jobs. Well, they're not in the United States. They're not here. In fact, we've amassed a trillion dollar trade deficit with Mexico since NAFTA passed. So all those people that they must live somewhere in outer space to think that that has actually created wealth in America. It has been a sucking sound, a sucking sound to other, to other countries not here. All you got to do is know the math. Know the math. Just look at the numbers. You don't have to believe me. Look at the trade accounts. It's written in black and white every month. We aren't winning. We are losing the trade uh, wars all over this world, and it is costing us investment here. It's costing us jobs here. It's costing us wealth here. And that is where those poverty figures are rising, because we aren't reading the math, and we aren't making goods in America and balancing our accounts here at well, home we, by putting people back to work. We certainly can rebuild the American manufacturing industry and there are ways of doing it. That was done in part when the president stepped up using the uh, stimulus money to rebuild General Motors and Chrysler and they're now back and millions of jobs have been saved and simultaneously the entire small business uh, supply chain is in order. Mr. Ryan, I know that you have other thoughts that you'd like to add, so please share with us. Well, I just think we're, we're competing directly now with China in, in such a significant and direct way. And so we put, say, $8 billion in the stimulus package for high-speed rail. I think China's spending, you know, tens of billions of dollars well over, over the next... Well over 100 billion. Well over 100, and I think it's 120 maybe, uh, billion dollars on high-speed rail. They're going to have more tracks in China you know, than the rest of the world combined in the next five or ten years. And we're sitting here saying we're not going to do anything because we're not for high-speed rail. Ohio gave back $400 million. Florida gave back you know, a few hundred million dollars that would have lured, and we know from conversations we've had with business people, would have lured companies into the state of Ohio because they want to build rail cars. But they're not going to build them if we don't have a high-speed rail program. And these are investments that we have made. We, we have gotten out of the mindset that the government can't do everything, but it has to do something. And what it has to do is make sure our roads and our bridges and our infra infrastructure is up to speed. Now, I was just talking with Congressman Doyle from Pittsburgh. He said... Three billion dollars in sewer projects need to get done, EPA mandated in Pittsburgh. I think Cleveland's two to three billion, Akron's about a billion, hundreds of millions in, in places like Youngstown and smaller cities. I'm sure Toledo's up there in the hundreds of millions, and Columbus, Sandusky. in these older cities. You know, I saw Rahm Emanuel, he was on uh, Chicago uh, mayor, he was talking about these are hundred year old systems in Chicago. Do we really think that Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Akron and Youngstown and Toledo have a billion dollars to go make these investments? No, but if we say collectively as a country we're going to rebuild the country and right now we're going to use the power that we have 
to go out and get the money and make these investments and put all these people back to work. They'll be working for a decade. Let me tell you how that could be done. It's in the President's American Jobs Act. He has suggested that we establish an infrastructure bank. Every one of the projects that you just described are cash flow projects. There's a fee for sewage. There's a fee for water. There are fees that, are, that come traditionally with each of these services. If we had an infrastructure bank, and the President has suggested we put $10 billion into it, we know that we could get the uh, various pension funds around, the public pension funds, to invest in it, and we could probably have $100 billion within uh, several months that could be invested in each one of the projects that you talked about, and those projects over time are able to repay. And do keep in mind that the federal government is now able to borrow that money at about 2% for 10 years. So this is an investment opportunity to build for the future. We've got about five minutes, so Ms. Captain, if you'll take about one or two of those, and Mr. Ryan, uh, Ms. Captain, if you'd like to take it, then we're going to wrap this thing up. I would just like to say that for investment in our ports, in our airports, in our rail, what could be more important to our country? When I was born, there were 146 million people in this country. We're now near 320 million people, and by 2050, we will have 500 million people in this country. We cannot continue to live like it's 1950. We have to sort of catch up, and that's where these public investments come in. They create jobs. They create real wealth that you can't take away or outsource. It belongs to the American people. It belongs here. And I wanted to say a word about Ohio, and we're facing this vote on issue two in Ohio, which is an effort, as Congressman Ryan says, to dismantle what's left of the middle class in our state, our teachers, our firefighters, our police. Um, we have a governor that called an Ohio highway patrolman an idiot, which I consider a complete uh, degradation of the office of governor and uh, an insult to those who put their lives on the line for us every day. We stand against issue two. We're going to defeat issue two in Ohio because we believe in building a middle class and we are proud of our police, of our highway patrolmen, of our firefighters, of our teachers. They hold us together as community and it is our job to push investment into airports, highways, high-speed rail, trains, transit, ports, water and sewer, all of the pieces of community that hold us together and make our economies hum. Either you're looking through the rearview mirror or the windshield going forward. This is an I can nation. The last four words of American are I can, and we are an I can country. And I yield my remaining well, time to the gentleman. Well, indeed, we can. Uh, this piece of legislation, H.R. 613, is one that I've introduced, and it simply says that this money that we want to invest in our sanitation systems, high speed rail, uh, energy systems, uh, whether those are the wind turbines or solar systems. That's American taxpayer money, and this bill said that if you're going to use American taxpayer money, then you're going to spend that money on American-made equipment. Make it in America. It's our money. Use it here in America. The Chinese currency bill, it ought to be passed. I know that our Republican colleagues are going to be following me here in a few minutes, and they're probably going to say the solution is to end regulation. Well, they had a bill on the floor that would end the regulation that would prevent the despoiling of our air with such things as mercury and arsenic and dioxins and other kinds of poisons. We can't build America by ending the regulations that protect America, the food safety regulations, the environmental safety regulations, the clean water regulations. That's not how we're going to build America. That's how we'll destroy this country. We will build America through the kinds of programs that the President has proposed with the American Jobs Act that's fully paid for with a fair tax system, one in which those at the top end of this uh, economy who have prospered so well over the last 15 years will now pay just a little bit more so that Americans can go back to work, so that those unnecessary tax breaks that have been given to the oil industry for a century, for a century, that five, six, seven billion dollars a year that they've received on top of their trillion dollars of profit over the last decades, those will be back into America's treasury so that we can build America once again. We will make it in America, and the President is quite right. We can't wait. Americans can't wait. It's time for Americans to go back to work. The American Jobs Act will put Americans back to work without 
increasing the deficit and, in fact, creating tax revenues for the American Treasury. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back and thank you. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Hartzler, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the topic of this special order. Without objection, it's approved. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I'm here to lead a very important discussion regarding America's greatest generation, our senior citizens. I have the greatest respect and heartfelt affection for this special group of people. This respect and aff affection originated with the special relationship I had with my grandparents. I valued spending time with them and loved learning from them. I learned how to catch a fish and golf from Granddad Zelmer, how to clean and cook a fish from Grandma Zelmer, how to ride a horse and milk a cow from Granddad Purdy, and how to crochet and make homemade butter from Grandma Purdy. Out of the love of my grandparents grew a love and respect for all senior citizens. I believe their wisdom should be sought and valued in our society and generations should be linked to benefit from each other. As a teacher, I initiated programs to bring young people together with senior citizens and wrote my master's thesis on it. I can tell you, it's a winning combination. Throughout my life, I have been dedicated to advocate for senior citizens. For over 10 years, I served on the Cass County Council on Aging. I helped raise money for our Meals on Wheels program and other important programs to help senior citizens. Now I'm honored to represent and to serve the great people of Missouri's 4th Congressional District, which is home to over 120,000 seniors. You can trust that I will ensure that this cherished generation is never overlooked. There are many challenges facing our nation's senior citizens, financial stress, health challenges, housing issues, and family difficulties. My Republican women colleagues and I want you to know that we care, we hear your concerns, and we are here to stand by you and fight for you and for workable solutions. I'm honored to have the privilege tonight of leading this discussion and introducing you to some of the most dedicated women in Congress who, like me, care about seniors and are fighting for you. So, now I would like to yield as much time as she may consume uh, to my good friend from just across the uh, state line, uh, from the great state of Kansas, a fellow farm girl, and uh, my travel buddy back and forth to the Kansas City Airport, uh, Representative Lynn Jenkins. Well, I thank the gentlelady from Missouri for yielding, and I appreciate my fellow Republican women stepping up this evening to have an honest, fact-based discussion about one of our nation's most uh, valued resources, our senior citizens. As I travel through Kansas each week, I always hear from folks who have had to tighten their belts over the last few years. Uh, and the overwhelming message I hear is that Kansans want their government to do the same. And seniors are no different. While special interest groups, many in the media, and several of our colleagues across the aisle like to paint our nation's seniors as weak, terrified of budget cuts and beholden to the federal government for financial security, seniors in Kansas know better. These are strong men and women who have seen our nation through a world war, cultural upheaval, and cyclical financial turmoil. They have always stayed true to the ideals and principles that make this country great. They have always been willing to make the necessary sacrifices to better their lives and those of their children and grandchildren. And they continue to display that same commitment during our current struggles. But you know what? Just because our seniors are willing to sacrifice does not mean we should continue to demand it. It's time we, the beneficiaries of their hard work and sacrifice, stopped asking for more and allowed our seniors to have the security and certainty that they have earned through decade upon decade of hard work. 
That's why I'm pleased to have supported the Republican House budget earlier this year that will save a Medicare system that could be bankrupt in eight years if we do nothing. And it makes a plan to save Social Security, which isn't far behind. Our plan saves these programs for the next generation while preserving 100% of the benefits for those Americans currently in or near retirement. I'll continue to fight to ensure seniors don't see any cuts in their benefits, like the cuts that were provided for under the President's health care law, which cuts Medicare by $500 billion and allows a board of bureaucrats to begin Again, rationing care. Uh, we will instead continue to work to protect and strengthen these important programs. The economic turmoil over the past several years has impacted all of us, including our seniors. Our nation's senior citizens, the greatest generation, worked their entire lives to make this country what it is today. Keeping the promises made to them over the years must be a priority of this Congress and of this nation. I yield back. Thank you. Appreciate your great remarks. And now I would like to yield uh, as much time as she may consume to another farm gal, fellow friend here from uh, South Dakota. And uh, so, Lady uh, Christy Nome. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady from Missouri for recognizing me and for facilitating this wonderful discussion that we have tonight in front of us to really talk about our seniors and to talk about the challenges that they face and the promises that we've made to them that we intend to uphold and to keep for the years to come. You know, I uh, rise tonight to speak on the special order with our other Republican female colleagues to discuss a lot of important issues. And I want everybody to know across this country, South Dakota, we have more than our than the average share of seniors in South Dakota. We have a very high number, and all of us have seniors in our families. Uh, grandparents, neighbors, friends who are seniors and live under the programs and policies of this country. And our seniors have worked hard. They've raised their families. Uh, they've raised grandchildren with strong values, with good worth, work ethics that are extremely important to them mm -hmm. to deal with a lot of the things that this life may throw at them. They've paid into Social Security. Uh, they've fought our enemies on foreign soil mm -hmm. to defend our country and our freedoms. They have built businesses, and they literally have created the fabric of our society in America today. Our Republican agenda reflects uh, the deep gratitude that we have towards our seniors in this country. We're thankful for the country that they've given us. We're thankful for the values that they've taught us, and we intend to follow through on the promises that we've made to them. So you're asking me today, what are the promises that we've made to our seniors? The first promise that we have made to them is to care for them. That's why we chose to step up and to save the Medicare program. That's why we didn't choose to not address the problem that we have and the fact that it is going to go broke in less than a decade. Uh, and we also did this at a time when we can truly fix the program without impacting seniors who currently rely on the program. Mm -hmm. Future generations will need that program, and we did offer solutions for that. But our current beneficiaries, all of those who are 55 and older, will not be impacted if we do what the Republicans did this year and fix the program so that it's still around. Nothing will change for seniors under the plan the Republicans have put forward. We've also made important promises to our seniors who are military veterans. South Dakota has a strong history of military service. Thousands of South Dakotans have stepped up and put their lives on the line to defend this country. Many of them have made the ultimate sacrifice, and for that we'll always be grateful. Many of them came home wounded or forever changed by the experience. Veterans earned and deserve all of the benefits that they were promised going back to the founding of this great country. Well, we've worked to protect those programs and protect those veterans and the programs that they rely on. Some in Washington and in the media try to scare our, our seniors. They try to scare them by telling them that we're going to cut military veterans' pensions and payments and programs and that we're going to cut the military veterans' benefits. Nothing could be further from the truth. Despite vicious rumors and whatever the media and Democrats try to say, we are not going to... Uh, let our veterans down and not follow through on the promises that we have made to them. We will continue to fight for those veterans' benefits. And finally, we also promised our seniors that we would leave to our kids and our grandkids a nation that is as exceptional as they left us. That means that we're focused on growing our economy, that we're reducing burdensome regulations that are driving people out of business and overseas. We're empowering small businesses at the same time, letting them make decisions for themselves uh, that the government has no right making. And we're cutting wasteful spending that does nothing but bloat government and crowd out the private sector. 
I am. Uh, in closing, let me just say that I'm proud to stand here with Republican women because we take our promises to our seniors very sincerely and seriously. And I know that we will do our part to uphold all of those promises that we've made. So thank you for the time. Thank you, lady. And absolutely, we, we are going to fulfill those promises. Now I would like to yield as much time as she may consume to the gentle lady from Texas. Uh, we have Representative Kay Granger tonight who wants to uh, share a little bit her thoughts on seniors. So, Thank you very much for yielding uh, to me and thank you for the time we get to talk about women and our seniors. Women have made great strides in the workforce and in politics, actually in all areas of life. But while we've had our careers, we're still the primary caregivers for our children. And we're the ones often responsible for managing our household budget. Additionally, many of us have added the responsibility of caring for our aging and sick parents that we owe so much to, as you've talked about. We know the importance of being there for our parents the way they were there for us throughout our lives. And that's why tonight the House Republican women are focusing on the issues that matter to America's seniors. While Medicare and Social Security often make the headlines, Alzheimer's disease is a challenge that's touched nearly all of us in some way, someone we know, if not our own family. Beyond the emotional toll, Alzheimer's is a disease that will weigh down our economy over the next century if it's not addressed head on. Nearly six million Americans are currently living with this disease. And every single day, more than 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65. As these baby boomers age, one in eight will develop Alzheimer's. At a time when our government is looking for ways to save money, thinking about the economic cost of diseases like Alzheimer's is an important priority to consider. Today, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, and we're seriously lacking in ways to prevent, cure, or even slow its progress. This year alone, the economic impact of caring for Alzheimer's patients will cost our economy a total of $183 billion. And unless something is done soon, the cost of Alzheimer's in the United States will total $20 trillion by the year 2050. $15 trillion of that cost will come from Medicare and Medicaid. This is a disease that is not only heartbreaking, but it's also a disease that we can't afford if we don't take action now. That means making Alzheimer a national priority. Leadership from the federal government has helped reduce the number of deaths from other diseases, such as HIV, AIDS, influenza, pneumonia, and stroke. We need to do the same thing for Alzheimer's. We have the potential to create the same success that's been demonstrated in fights against other major, major diseases by making Alzheimer our priority, we can cut down on both the financial and the human cost of this disease. So I'm proud to stand with my Republican colleagues and talk about the issues that seniors and their families are dealing with every day, and we can find solutions. Thank mm. you. Thank you, lady. I certainly share your, share your commitment and uh, the heart-wrenching reality of Alzheimer's and our need to focus on it here. Uh, our next speaker is uh, from the great state of Washington, uh, Representative Jamie Herrera-Butler. Thank you, and I, and I thank my colleague and actually the, the women, the Republican women who have joined us here tonight to talk about such an important issue and to share what we've been doing. Uh, on, on behalf of our nation's seniors because I believe we need to protect the rights of our nation's seniors. The right to make choices about their health care, the right to access what they spend their entire working lives paying into, the right to know that the programs that exist today will be there when they need them. Let's talk specifically about this. The right to make choices. Now, in my corner of the country in southwest Washington state, more than a third of our seniors have chosen Medicare Advantage. That's 37 percent have made this choice. In my most populated county, in Clark County, half of the seniors have chosen to use Medicare Advantage. Part of the reason for this, and many times is, uh, you, you see this happen, is because fewer and fewer doctors are taking traditional 
uh, Medicare just doesn't pay enough to cover the bills. But with Medicare Advantage and you're a new, you're a new uh, Medicare beneficiary, you might have a shot at getting a doctor. This is really important when we have 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single day. You know, we stand with our nation's seniors when it comes, and I say we, my Republican women colleagues and myself, uh, when it comes to accessing programs that they've spent their whole lives paying for. You know, the Medicare Board of Trustees has released, Medic actually, Medicare Board of Trustees and the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, two nonpartisan uh, groups who are tasked with, uh, with, what, with figuring out what the cost of bills are, and, and, me and uh, that's CBO and, and uh, Medicare. The trustees are tasked with the financial responsibility of keeping Medicare on the straight and narrow. Both have said within the next decade, Medicare goes completely bankrupt. So if, if, any, if, you're, if you're at home and you're watching this, the one thing you need to know, doing nothing is not an option. Ten years, ten years, and Medicare goes insolvent. You know what that means? It means that those seniors who have paid their whole life into this program are suddenly going to be, pace, be faced with choices. Uh, are they going to face cuts in benefits or more limited services? It, insolvent, completely insolvent. We have to do something, which is why earlier this year my re Republican colleagues and myself joined together to put forward solutions for Medicare, to save it and protect it. Those folks who have paid into this program their whole lives deserve to pull that money out when it's time to access it, which means we need to take action now. And I urge my colleagues in the Senate, consider the House passed budget, because what it does is protect retirement benefits for everyone who is 55 and older, right? completely keeps it as it is. And then for those in my generation who are younger, who are coming up the, coming up the pike, it changes it necessarily so that we can also access those benefits we'll pay into. So I, I'm excited today to join with my colleagues to make sure we, we protect these important programs. And seniors have a right to these programs, which is why we're stepping forward. We're going to stand with them uh, to make sure that what they've paid into, they're going to be able to access when it, when it comes time. You know, the, the seniors in southwest Washington have spent years planning for their retirement. My colleagues and I will continue to take the lead when it comes to protecting programs like Medicare and their choices within Medicare. We have, we have fought and will continue to, to fight against the credit card spending and against that mentality which jeopardizes this program because because our seniors do deserve uh, that which they've paid into. Now, the Republican women uh, that have joined me tonight on the floor to talk about these important issues, we understand that our nation's seniors have rights, and they're looking for us to protect those rights, to protect Medicare for them and for future generations. So with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I'm a little bit shorter than you are. Now I'm happy to yield my good friend and fellow runner from the great state of Ohio, Congresswoman Jean Schmidt. Jean? Thank you to my good friend from Missouri. You know, I often talk about kitchen table politics in this well, because as Ronald Reagan said in his farewell speech, all good ideas begin at the dinner table, and they do. Look at this poster. This is a poster that I think really illustrates what's going on in families all across America, including our seniors. And that's how are we going to pay our bills, and how are we going to move to the future? It's a huge issue, and it's one this Congress needs to address in many ways. You know, the U.S. Census says that over 40 million Americans today are 65 years or older. Almost 20 percent of our American families, almost 20 percent of those sitting around that kitchen table. These are an incredible group of people. These are the people who fought in World War II, that created the greatest generation. They fought in Korea sustaining the greatest generation, and today are now faced with so much anxiety and uncertainty in our nation. And one of the things I think that we have to do in Congress is to erase that anxiety. Whether it's through the financial markets, to ensure that we are putting forth programs 
that allow our banking systems to work effectively so that they don't have to be concerned with what the cost of banking is going to be or what their financial assets are going to be. To make sure that our businesses are flourishing in this country and not bridled by, saddled with unnecessary regulations that constrict them from going forward to move with the, with, within the economy. In other words, we have to get our economy moving. It is so important for our nation, especially for our seniors. But I think that there are some other things that we have to talk about with our seniors as well. You know, as we sit around the kitchen table and we worry about our bills, they also worry about not just how they're going to pay their income tax, but the, the mammoth issue of paying the income tax. And for seniors, instead of having to go to an accountant and use their precious dollars to figure the whole system out, maybe we should pass H.R. 1058, the Senior Tax Simplification Act of 2011. You know, this is a bipartisan bill, and if passed, would direct the Secretary of the Treasury to make available a new federal income tax form similar to the 1040EZ form for people that have turned over 65. It would make the completion of the federal income tax return simpler, faster, and easier, and less costly for most of our American hard-working seniors. I think another bill that we have to really look at and this is the one I really want to focus the rest of my talk on, is the repeal of the death tax. Because this is an issue that I've had to personally face in my life. I grew up on a family farm, and there's nothing better than being raised on a farm. It's the best way you can raise a family, and you do a lot of talking at that kitchen table. But you know, when my dad was seeing his declining days, he realized if he didn't do something, hire a fancy attorney at a lot of money an hour, he wouldn't be able to pass that farm along to his kids. And so he did some estate planning, but you know what? It wasn't enough. And at the end of the day, when my father passed away, my brother, sister, and I had to make a collective decision to sell personal assets to just be able to keep that farm because we want our children and our grandchildren to have the same experience that we had. And I think, how often is this occurring unnecessarily? And it's not just the family farm, it's the family business, whether it's a manufacturing business, whether it's a, a, a a winery, uh, whatever the business is, if it's a family business, why do we have to worry as we see our declining years how we're going to do some tax structures and pay an insurance plan and whatever else is out there to try to keep a part of it for our children? It's counterproductive because in the end, the, the federal government may get a piece of money at your death but that's the end of the money they'll ever get from you or your family. Ending the death, death tax won't hurt our economy. It will only improve our economy. And for our seniors that sit around that kitchen table that may have what we call land poor, have a lot of money in the land but not a lot of money in the bank, they won't be forced to make the same decisions so many of my friends had to make when I went to their family funerals. And they said, by gosh, we're going to keep dad and mom's farm. We're not going to get rid of it. They weren't as fortunate as my sister, my brothers, and I were that we had some personal assets that we could use to keep our farm. They had to sell theirs. And what's left? Brick and mortar? It's a serious issue. We need to repeal it, and I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do this. It will not only move our economy forward, but for our hardworking American seniors, it will alleviate that anxiety at the kitchen table. I yield back. Thank you, Fran. Well spoken. And now I get to introduce uh, the vice chairman of our conference and our good friend from Washington, Representative Kathy Morris Rogers. Thank you very much, Vicki. And I'm proud to join a dynamic group of Republican women tonight committed to preserving the American dream, promoting economic growth, and protecting America's seniors. And we have a story to tell. 
And it's a story not just of our children and our grandchildren, but also of our parents and our grandparents, of the men and women who raised us, who contributed and fought for this great country, and of the generation that's actually been hit the hardest by the economic downturn. One of these seniors is my own dad. Now, this summer, when President Obama actually threatened to withhold secu Social Security checks and not to reimburse Medicare providers, my dad called me and said, well, Kathy, I might be moving in with you, and no, I won't be babysitting. <laughs> now, you know, President Obama was wrong, and yet seniors all across this country were threatened and scared by that statement. And, and they continue to be frightened by the administration's policies. Let's just take a look at Medicare. It's a program that both Republicans and Democrats agree is unsustainable. But yet, today, try to find a doctor who will take a new Medicare patient in America. It is impossible or difficult. And the average couple, over the course of their lifetime, when they turn 65, will have paid just over $100,000 into Medicare, and they will pull out of that program over $300,000. It's not too difficult to do the math. It is unsustainable. The system is going bankrupt, and now is the time to improve it. Yet last year, we saw a health care bill pass that is actually going to make it worse. The president's health care bill will actually give 15 unelected bureaucrats in D.C. the power to cut Medicare and drive providers out of service. The Republicans want to give patients the power to put market pressure on providers and make them compete. We are here tonight as daughters, committed to helping our parents and their entire generation of hardworking Americans ensure that this program does not go bankrupt over the next 10 years. We refuse to let that happen. We're committed to finding the right answers to improving, reforming, protecting a program that our parents have contributed to for decades. And so this is our moment. It's our moment to make real changes for America. It's our moment to listen to each other's stories. And it's our moment to protect our seniors, their benefits, and their access to quality care. We're going to continue to do this for many years to come to share the great story of the American dream and our senior citizens who embody it. And thank you very much for the opportunity to participate tonight. Sure. Thank you, Kathy. Now I'd like to 